Welcome from the First Presbyterian Church in Burbank. We're glad you're here. Let's join the service now and hear the proclaiming of God's Word. Matthew chapter 4, we begin a new series on why Jesus. Why Jesus? And uh, we'll look more at that. But uh, now we have a familiar passage about the temptation of Jesus. We covered a little bit of that in January. Let's pick it up again and see Jesus and the devil. This is a showdown, if you will. Listen to the word of the Lord. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. I'll never forget the movie, uh, at least it was embedded in my mind as a young boy, watching the movie High Noon. Remember High Noon? Gary Cooper played the part of Marshall Will Cain, and and, uh, the man in that movie stands against the powers of evil all alone. In the movie, Cain is about to retire when he hears that one of the men he put away, Frank Marshall, has been released and is coming to kill him. Miller and his gang arrive in Hadleyville to meet Cain and exact revenge, and Cain struggles about what he should do. Should he stick around? Should he leave? Should, what do you do? His new bride, Amy Fowler, played by Grace Kelly, uh, encourages him not to fight because of her faith, and, and, uh, but to flee with her. The people of the town uh, with Gary Cooper have mixed feelings. They don't know what to do. Everyone says, well, maybe you should fight. Others, well, maybe you should leave. But nobody will join him. And in the movie at the end, there is Marshall Will Cain all by himself to face the gang. I won't give away the movie of how he does it, but I will give this away. He wins. The reason this impression comes to mind is because when I read the story here, this is of Jesus and the devil, a showdown. I can't help but think of High Noon with Gary Cooper and the the admiration I have for one man to stand against evil, even though but nobody else will. In our passage this morning, we see Jesus, who will be alone most of his life. He's, he's born in obscurity. He is raised in Nazareth as a young boy, probably didn't have many friends because of what they said about his mother. He will grow up in ministry, and people will follow him, but then they're fickle. They'll leave him. At the end of his life, he will face the cross all by himself, and he will destroy evil and sin. That's who Jesus is. He's our hero. In fact, I would dare say that all of the heroes on the screen, all of the heroes in story, all of the heroes in history are just a small shadow of the great hero that Jesus is for all of us. We all need a hero. He is that hero. He is the real hero who can can change our lives. And he meets the devil. He's just been baptized. He is driven in the wilderness. And there in the wilderness now, he will face the devil. Sir George Adam Smith Uh, who traveled over that area, wrote these words about the location where Jesus was. Let me read these words. He says, The wilderness is an area of yellow sand, of crumbling limestone, and of scattered shingle. It is an area of contorted strata where the ridges run in all directions as if they were warped and twisted. The hills are like dust heaps. The limestone is blistered and peeling. Rocks are bare and jagged. Often the very ground sounds hollow when a foot or a horse's hoof falls upon it. It glows and shimmers with heat like some vast furnace. It runs right out to the Dead Sea, and then there comes a drop of 1,200 feet, a drop of limestone, flint, marl, through crags and quarries and precipices down to the Dead Sea. What a horrifying place. Barren, desolate, 
In fact, this was the devil's place, you could call it. It was where Jesus would meet him. What was supposed to be paradise in earth had now turned into an image of the wilderness. The devil, as you remember, we talked about in January, stole creation of, from God through Adam and Eve, stole it. Adam and Eve took the devil's advice to disobey, and at that moment, creation was infected with sins. We see in the Bible, at the moment they sinned, thorns pop up from the ground. Think about the image of Jesus on the cross, how he had thorns upon his head. He came to reverse the effects of sin and destruction. Jesus called the devil the father of this world in John 8. Ephesians 2, the apostle Paul said, the devil is the prince of the kingdom of the air. What was once now paradise had turned into hell. The world, when Jesus appeared, had been under tyranny for a long time. Disease and illness had infected humans. And Jesus came to reverse that. He healed the sick. Death had taken over. Jesus raised the dead. The angels who left their habitations in rebellion to God found places in the earth and then even entered humans and took over their lives. And Jesus cast them out. Jesus came to reverse the hell that was here. And I want to say this morning that if you find your life a living hell, he can come and reverse that in your life too. He can turn the barrenness, the heat, the fires, and turn it into paradise yet again. That is the work of the Messiah, to come and to renew all things, to turn it back into the kingdom of God. And we who are followers of Jesus then do the same thing. We go out in the world to reverse the curse of sin and death through Jesus. Now, when Jesus met the devil in this barren place, perhaps no better place on the earth to meet him, everything was at stake the devil was about to meet his match. Well, actually, the devil may not have known, perhaps, that Jesus was not a match for him. Jesus was powerful. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus, the anointed one. Jesus is God incarnate. Jesus is the creator of all things on, in, in heaven and on earth. This would be like the, the, the devil rowing his boat out to meet Jesus. And I guess you row backwards. Sorry, I'm rowing forward there. <laughs> You know, that's going to bother me later tonight. I just have to think about like, rowing out to meet Jesus, right? In a rowboat while Jesus is there on a battleship. That's the battle that's soon to happen. But don't mistake that for the possibility that Jesus could have failed. He could have. In fact, if Jesus had failed in any small portion, in thought, word, deed, or action, any small, minute detail, it would all be over forever. What was at stake was creation. Jesus, in the, uh, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, the first letter, in chapter 15, calls Jesus the second Adam. He has now come to the showdown to do what Adam and Eve, who were Adam, Adam, to do what they failed, Jesus will now not fail. We note, as scholars have pointed out to us, that the temptation of eating the fruit in the garden was threefold temptation. We looked at it in January. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Adam and Eve looked at that fruit and their eyes wanted it. Their flesh wanted it. And they were told that when they ate it, they would become God. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Now Jesus will face three temptations in the wilderness the same way. The lust of the eyes. The devil took Jesus and said, Look, Jesus, look at all the kingdoms, all of the world. I can give you these kingdoms. You don't have to go to the cross. Just worship me. I'll give them to you. I imagine as Jesus looked out at the kingdoms for which he came to bring back to God, I can imagine Jesus feeling that temptation and saying, Wow. Wow. I could have this in a second. I wouldn't have to go to the cross. He had seen people hanging on the cross during his lifetime. He knew that was his destiny. And Jesus, in a moment, said, Nope. No. Away from me, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. The devil reminded Jesus, Hey, Jesus, you haven't eaten in 40 days. 
you must be hungry. Your flesh must desire some food. Turn these stones into bread, Jesus. Fill your belly. And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Jesus, I can hear the devil cackling. You're important. Jesus, you're the son of God. You're the anointed one. The scriptures say that that the angels will take care of you lest you dash your foot against a stone. Why don't you do this? As he brought Jesus up to the highest part of the temple. Throw yourself down. After 40 days in the wilderness, you must be discouraged. It certainly would be okay to have a little encouragement. Throw yourself down, and as you fall, the angels will swoop down from heaven and grab you and hold you up. You know that, I know that. You just need some encouragement. You are the Son of God, the pride of life. And Jesus said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Deuteronomy 6.16. Now, if Jesus had given in, in any way over those 40 days, we wouldn't be here this morning. All would have been lost. Where Adam and Eve failed, now the second Adam came. They were cut off by God, from God, because of their disobedience from God. God had told them, in the day you disobey, you eat the fruit, you'll surely die, and they died. And now it would require one who was human to obey the covenant. But we're told in the Bible this truth, all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Who could save us? We need a hero, but it's impossible. So God became human. And God fulfilled the covenant. Every point of the covenant, Jesus fulfilled the law. In him, not one thing was undone. He came to fulfill the covenant so that he could stand before God and say, okay, now the covenant exists. It's between you, Father, and me. And if that were all it was, we would still be doomed. But Jesus went to the cross and paid the penalty for all of us. Imagine that. So there on the cross as Jesus died, his last words, he would cry out, it is finished. Religament, religion has taken place. He has brought us to God and brought us to one another. It is finished. There is now no more divisions. The covenant has been restored because he paid the penalty. We who come to him receive the righteousness as though we had never sinned from the beginning. Can you imagine that? Your sins, my sins, past, present, future when we receive Christ into our lives are gone no more as if they never were this is why when we receive Jesus he restores what was taken from us he heals our diseases he fixes our broken minds we were constantly Broken because of what others have said to us or what we think about ourselves. Jesus says, no! You have my righteousness. Where we have death, we can now boldly proclaim we're going to live forever because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. You believe in me, you'll never die. That's what Jesus said. He took the death upon himself so we could take his life upon ourselves. Why, Jesus? Because he fixes us. He saves us. And he loves us. Now, before we look at in this series as we go through the next couple of weeks, I think it's very important for us to understand one thing. I know you already understand this, but you face many people who don't understand this, and I want to give you some helpful way. 
there, there is this belief in the world that Jesus may not have existed. There are many who say, well, Jesus, we don't even know. He, Jesus of Nazareth, somebody made him up. But, but this morning, I want to say to you, to understand who Jesus is, we need to know that he really lived. I believe with all my heart there was a Jesus of Nazareth. One Bible scholar, Donald Hagner, once wrote, true Christianity, the Christianity of the New Testament documents, is absolutely dependent on history. At the very heart of the New Testament faith is the assertion that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. 2 Corinthians 5.19. The incarnation, the death, the resurrection of Jesus as a real event in time and place, space, as historical rallies are indispensable foundations of Christian faith. To my mind, then, Christianity is best defined as the recitation of, the celebration of, and the participation in God's acts in history, which, as the New Testament writings emphasize, have found their culmination in Jesus Christ. Jesus, in fact, is the most historical figure that ever lived, because in him all of history meets In Jesus, past, present, future, all meet in Jesus. He was before, he is, and he will always be. And history comes from him, lives in him, and will meet him one day. Now, I would just love to go through a really quick list, if I could. The list of people who acknowledge his living in the first and second centuries is staggering. Cornelius Tacitus was a Roman historian who lived through the reigns of six Roman emperors. Tacitus was called the greatest historian of ancient Rome. People said, he is a good and moral man. We trust his words. And he wrote about Jesus. He alluded to the death of Christ and the presence of Christians in Rome during the time of Nero. Lucian of Samosata was a Greek satirist. During the second half, the last half of the second century, he spoke with hatred about Christ and the Christians because he believed Jesus was real and everybody knew that. We find a man named Thallius who was one of the first secular writers to mention Christ in the year 52 AD. We see in addition uh, a man named Suetonius, another Roman historian and court official under Hadrian who stated in his Life of Claudius, about the Jews and the Christians and expelling them from Rome, which, by the way, is mentioned in Acts chapter 18, verse 2, the year 49 AD, it took place. We find uh, Pliny the Younger, governor of Bithynia in Asia Minor, who talked about Jesus of Nazareth. We find Phlegon, another authority who wrote a book called, a history called Chronicles, because he couldn't figure out what happened in the year 33 AD when in the middle of the day the world became dark. Isn't that amazing? An event that we know happened as Jesus died upon the cross in the middle of the day. Mara bar Serapion was Syrian and Stoic philosopher, and he writes to his son and says, Son, I encourage you to pursue wisdom. And in his letter, he compared Jesus to Socrates and Pythagoras. Now, I just want to say this to you because the evidence is overwhelming that there was a man, extra biblically, overwhelming that there was a man called Jesus of Nazareth and that he changed the world forever. Oh, some would say, okay, we'll believe that there's a Jesus of Nazareth, but certainly his followers must have exaggerated everything he said. Well, look at the lives of the disciples. And we see their lives that that at the moment of Jesus' execution, they run, they flee. High noon, no one's with Jesus. But three days later, they will stand from then on before kings and governors and rulers and say, "Do do with us what you want. Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. And they'll all be put to death. 500 people saw Jesus alive after his resurrection. All of them died, never announcing that Jesus was alive and real. I'm convinced that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And and, and let me share, as I end the message, three reasons why. Number one, because I've studied him all my life. The more I try to pull apart the story of Jesus from the Bible or in history, the more convinced I am this Jesus was the foundation of all things. Number one. Number two, 
I've seen Jesus change lives. I've seen people who are addicted to sin or other addictions all of a sudden receive them in their life and now they live in power and victory instead of in victimhood. But most importantly to me, though I've studied him all my life and believe him, seen his work in other people's lives, for me the most important thing is that I know him to be real because he changed my life. And I still struggle with things, but I know he's real. He talks to me. He walks with me. He goes to the dark places that I don't want to go to. When I find myself in a place, I go, God, how did I get here? Jesus said, it's okay, I'm with you. Follow me. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. And the same is true for you today. If you're struggling believing in Jesus, I encourage you to invite him into your life. If your life is, is, is somehow gone astray, you need the Gary Cooper to come in and fix it. But I got one bigger than Barry, Gary Cooper. His name's Jesus. And he can take all the things that have gone wrong and make them right. He can take the barrenness and the desert and make it a place of beauty. He can take the death that is alive in your life and you know it and you feel it and he can bring life so that your life is one in which rivers of living water gush forth from your life. That's what Jesus does. He reverses the effects of sin. In 381, there was a man named Gregory of Nazianzus, who's one of the early church fathers. Let me end the message by saying that he beautifully describes Jesus' life and how he reverses all things. Jesus began his ministry by being hungry. He's the bread of life. Jesus ended his earthly ministry by being thirsty. He's the living water. Jesus was weary. He's our rest. Jesus paid tribute. He's the king. Jesus was accused of having a demon, but he cast out the demons. Jesus wept. He wipes all our tears away. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. He redeemed the world. Jesus was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. He is the good shepherd. Jesus died, yet by his death, he destroyed the power of death. That's why we need Jesus. Because he's real. And he loves us and he walks with us. And the Spirit keeps encouraging us in our life to turn all things over to him. If you haven't received him into your life, maybe this morning you would do that. It's between you and him. But maybe you might say, Jesus, look at my life. It's not going right. I need you. Or maybe you might say, Jesus, look at my life. Everything's going right. But I feel empty without you. Why, Jesus? Because he loves you, and he wants the best for your life. And I declare to you, Casey, you declared this yesterday, Debbie's father is in heaven with Jesus. Christine, your mother's in heaven with your father, with Jesus. Friends, we will be with Jesus forever. Let's pray. Oh God, as we come to communion, we thank you for what it means that you who were all in all, that you who were filled with beauty and magnificence came to earth in lowliness. You who are life died that we might have life for ourselves. Oh God, Holy Spirit, fall upon us new and fresh today. May we receive that gift Nothing can we do for it but just to receive it. May we experience the grace that changes our life because you're with us. Amen. We hope this service has been a blessing to you. We also invite you to join us to worship in person on Sunday mornings. We have services at 9.15 and 11.15. Thank you for watching and may God bless you.